If you want to open up your Bibles, please, to John 17. Um, this is actually the Lord's Prayer. We have the model prayer that we actually recited last week together. When Jesus was asked, how do you pray? He said like this and gave us that model prayer that we better know as the Lord's Prayer. But this is actually a prayer, a long prayer. It's not the only one, but the only long prayer that we get to listen in as Jesus is praying to God. So we know, first off, that prayer is an important part of Jesus' life. We are told that he regularly snuck off into the mountains or to a lonely place to spend hours in prayer with his father. And if Jesus and God are one, which I believe they are, and they're connected intimately, and yet Jesus still felt the need to pray, I think we need to pay attention. Amen. And we can learn from listening in on this prayer what's at the heart of our God and our Savior. As many of you know, I used to coach soccer, and I loved it very much. But one year was difficult. The team just did not connect. There was one player that the other players didn't like, and he was very skilled, but they would never pass to them. They didn't like it. And he had an anger problem, and he would get angry with them, and he would complain, and then just give up. And he, oh, it was just a mess, and they just wouldn't gel. Uh, as a team, very skilled guys, but they didn't gel as a team. And we didn't do that well. We could have done a lot better if they could have ever put aside their differences and worked together. Soccer is for sure a team sport. You've got to have that passing. You've got to work together as a team. And even in the def defense, we don't think of defense as being that important in soccer because we're not tackling somebody and knocking them off their feet like in uh, American football, but it's important that they are working together as a team. And that year, I struggled the entire season and never accomplished that. Uh, and it was very frustrating because usually that's one of the things that I like to say was one of my signatures as a coach was that, uh, well, one, I was known as the calm coach, but the other was of getting the guys to cooperate together. Usually at the age I had, they were coming from different schools, so they weren't friends at school. They didn't know each other, but helping them to gel as a team. And I just failed that year. I was not able to, and we didn't have as successful a year in playing soccer. My friends, we don't also think of the church as a team. The Bible uses the word body. Maybe I should go with that better than team, because you know, if your body's not working together... There's a problem. This not working as it should, if one part's working against the other, it's going to be difficult. So your mind is not telling you you don't need that third scoop of ice cream. And so this expands and this hurts. <laughs> we got to work together as a team, as a church family. Therefore, last week's message on the need and the importance of that reconciliation. We've got conflict in this church family. Nothing is more important than getting that resolved first before we try to do anything for God. That we've got to come together in that unity. So let's listen in on a part of Jesus' prayer to his Father. So remember, this is Jesus' prayer, starting in verse 20. And Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22 I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those whom you have given me 
to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful picture into the heart of your Son who reflects your heart. Help us, as we are listening to your word this morning, to understand that, that we are peering inside the very heart of God. Inside your heart, understanding your passions, your desires, your dreams for us. Help us to listen with the ears of our heart and allow your love to fill our heart and to cause a great, strong unity within the body of the church. Amen. 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 So who did Jesus pray for, according to verse 20? Us and himself. And he prayed for us as believers. So this is specific. But not just the people who were his disciples right now, but to all who would believe in the future. So his prayer was for every follower of Christ alive when he was praying, but also everybody that might believe through their message. So a sidebar, we need to be sharing the message. It's how people are going to be saved. That's just kind of an understood in Jesus' prayer. So he's praying for all of his followers. This is his heart's desire for us. And so what is our model of unity? He's praying for unity. I think that's pretty clear. He says it clearly. But what's our model? What is this unity to look like? Jesus' relationship with God. Again, that's very clear. He says, like I am in you and you are in me. What does that mean? There is an intimacy with God that we still cannot describe. Theologians argue over it. Some don't even believe in the Trinity because it's just beyond our mind's understanding of how can there be three beings or whatever you might call them, but yet they're so united they appear as one. And that's the beauty of this unity. It's not that we all think exactly alike. It's okay to even have different opinions. But we've got to have that same goal. The unity of the Father and the Son was that mankind might be redeemed, but not just saved from hell. That's kind of, again, that side note. But to be saved into a relationship with God. That's their heart's desire. And they're in unity that no matter what it costs, that's what they're going to do. They work together. Now, we see in the prayer in the garden, Jesus kind of says, hey, Dad, you think there might be another way? I'm in agreement with our goal. I haven't changed that. I want to see people redeemed to be able to be in a relationship with you. <laughs> but, but you got any other options? Could, could you check just one more time? Might there be another way we could do this? But he never changed his commitment to the goal. Their heart continued to beat the same. It wasn't Jesus just wanting to get out of his commitment. No, it was just he did not want to take on the sins of the world because he knew how painful that would be. It was not the suffering on the cross he wanted to escape. It was the suffering in his heart and his soul Amen. that he didn't think he could bear taking on the pain of being separated from his father, of experiencing that. What did he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The greatest anguish for Jesus was spiritual. Physical was horrible. 
It was extremely painful. I don't want to discount that. I don't want to disrespect what he re suffered physically. But we focus on that because we can understand that. And we have this understanding of that any physical pain will soon end. Either we'll get better or we get really better. <laughs> if you get my drift. But this is spiritual pain. There's no medicine for that. There's no doctor that can fix that. And it won't end if we don't come to the great physician to fix it now. That's the heart of our God and his son, Jesus Christ, is that there's a unity like they have with a commitment that whatever the cost is, I want to make sure everyone has that opportunity to be set free and be in a relationship with God, to know love. why I wanted to become a pastor. There's something about being loved by God that is amazing. Just amazing. And I want everybody to know that. I'm not super successful, so I would never say that I'm a person that fixes people up, but I love people just know their love, so I love to be a part of trying to help people meet and connect and get together. I prayed for those two. Can't take any credit that they got together, but oh, I thought finally one's going to ask her to marry him. Woo! You know, there's something about seeing people have that opportunity to experience being loved and cherished. And so there's a commitment to that. And that's what God is saying we need to have. That's that unity, that we have one purpose. Doesn't mean we all think alike. Doesn't mean we have to even do it alike. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a variety of chur churches. It's kind of like having a variety of ice cream flavors. But we need to be working together as a church family with that same goal. I don't know if you know, but I meet monthly with the pastors of the churches here in Davis, and we share that one heart's desire. We pray for each other. We pray for our families. We pray for our churches with that one goal. No competition, but as a family that has a heart's desire to see Davis set free in this very dark city. That's the unity. That's that model so we're not just in agreement theologically. We're not just in agreement even in our practice of how we're supposed to do worship. We can't even get that right. Satan wants to divide us, and yes, he'll divide us over those little things. Because he wants to divide our hearts. Look in verse 23. Jesus' prayer is for complete unity, not just appearance of unity. We could even be cooperating. This church is good at cooperating together. We have a sweet fellowship, but do we share a complete unity with a heart's desire that the, the top thing we want to do, no matter what it costs us, no matter the time, no matter the suffering, no matter the embarrassment, that our top priority is that the world might know Jesus Christ. Amen. Are we working together for that one goal? And that's it. No matter what it costs, no matter what we suffer, we have one heart goal that's in agreement with God's. That's the prayer. So it's not just that we become uh, in agreement and we don't argue in our church. It's that we are like God, that we are so united that we move as one. And it will be difficult for the world to explain. I don't think that it's just um, coincidental that we can't explain the Trinity. That as best as we can, we just kind of faith and trust it. Well, it's not so much that we have to trust it. It's just we just can't explain it. And that's the problem. And we have a difficulty, especially with our Western mindset of something we can't explain and control. But the reality is that God, however you want to call him a being, a God, a spirit, is that he, his son, and the Holy Spirit work together in agreement so much that they appear as one. There is no division, and they blend together so beautifully because they have one heart's desire. 
And that said, every man, woman, boy, and girl are in a relationship with them and know they're loved. What's the result of this unity? Verse 21 says that the world may believe. Verse 23 says to let the world know. What makes the news? Anytime there's a fight in the church. Recently, a, a large denomination has made the news. Not because of the good they're doing, and there's a lot of good they do, but about the conflict that's going on, about the covering up of some sin. I don't know any of the specifics, don't know how much truth there is into the story. That's not why I'm telling you the name. But what made the news is the story of division. It's what the world wants to see. That's what they expect to see because they know we're broken, sinful people. But what's amazing to the world is when a group of broken, hurting, sinful people can come together and work together in love for the same purpose, the same goal. And when I understand that's my father's goal and I'm filled with his love, I can't help but desire that same thing. So the result of this unity is I validate the ministry of Jesus Christ. Because I live like he made a difference in my life. Amen. You with me on that? I hear some amens and thank you. I appreciate that. At least I know you're not sleeping. Or, excuse me, praying for me. His ministry is one of reconciliation. And if I show people that I've been reconciled to God and he's changed my heart and filled it with love, people are going to notice. We live in a world that's ever increasingly filled with hatred and murder and anger. That I think our light would shine even brighter today if we were a people of love that desired that reconciliation. You see, we look at that, this tragedy in Texas, and I will agree, it's a tragedy. We'll say, why? Why does that happen? These sweet little kids, I cannot imagine the parents' angst when they got the phone call that their second or third grader was murdered at school. Or even the teacher's family. Teachers who are giving their life, because they don't do it for the money, that are giving their life to love on and to help these children, shot and killed at school. But I think God would ask is, where was the church loving on this kid who carried so much anger? Where was the church? I don't know anything about this kid other than obviously he had to be filled with anger and confusion. I don't even know if it was his school. I don't even know if he knew anybody he shot, if he had personal anger at anyone. I haven't heard any of that yet, but it doesn't matter. Where was the church loving on him and helping him work through those struggles and that anger and that hatred? Because you see, if we would have been there loving on him, maybe we could have stopped it instead of been mourning it. Where is the church with the thousands of children that are killed daily. It's easy to stand back and judge and complain, but we're called to be united with our Father with a desire for people to be set free and know love. Amen. And when your heart is filled with love, you're not going to be the person that goes out and shoots and kills people. I'm sorry, that's just, that's just a fact. If your heart is filled with love, if you are secure in knowing you're loved and you're valued and you're cherished and you're important and you have a purpose in the world, you're not the one that's going to go out and be just killing people. Amen. So yes, God has done something to stop violence in this world. He saved you and me. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. 
So then we move on and Jesus said, Father, I want them to know my glory. I gave them the glory you gave to me. What is this glory that Jesus gave to us? What is this glory that God gave to Jesus? Well, if we read in the verses, we'll see one. He says, I have given. It's already ours. We just may not know it. What is this glory? Well, when Jesus was baptized, God said, here is the glory of the Father. That's my son. The glory, I think, that God gave to Jesus is his love. The glory then that Jesus gives to us is his love. The glory of just, I'm loved. I am loved by my creator. And he fills my heart with that love. That's the glory of God, that he is a loving, patient, long-suffering God. And if I have that in my heart, that's what's supposed to be coming out to the world around me. Lisa and I were just talking last night. We, we have this goal to try when we are at a store or something and the person's making all these mistakes. Instead of getting frustrated, is just to stop and say to ourselves, maybe it's their first day and they're still learning. Or maybe they've just had a bad day. Maybe this is just the worst day of their life and we're going to complain just because we have to wait a little bit. They may have gotten some horrible news about their health or about family. And so, yes, they're distracted and they're making mistakes. Wouldn't it be a lot better as the church if we gave love and support? Amen. Instead of frustration, adding more pain to that person's life? Because if you're in training, maybe you've been at the same job, job for a long time now and you forgot what it's like to be in the learning stage. You know. Or maybe you've forgotten because you've never had a bad day, how difficult it is to be focused, maybe even on a job that you've done daily for years. You see, the glory of God looks beyond self to see a heart that may be hurting that needs to be loved on. A heart that just needs somebody to say, are you okay? Are you okay? Can I pray? People then will see God's glory in us, working in us, because it's the love of God that is the glory of God. Amen. And when it's manifest in our lives, people will know Oh, God really did send his son to redeem the world, to transform lives. Because I'm seeing a life that's been transformed. I'm seeing a life that was transformed. What do we do now? We, we're getting ready to go to a restaurant. We're looking for a doctor. We're looking for a yard person. We go in and we read the reviews. What did they do for me? How did they transform my life, my yard, my car, my belly? We want to see what difference can they make. There's no Yelp for Christ. But there's a church that is supposed to be the advertisement, the review. Amen. Problem is, we're not posting. What is the result of this glory? It's fellowship with Christ. When I get and receive that love, that love of God, that desire to see people reconcile, then guess what? I join the team. And I'm working with God and with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit for their goal. I get welcomed onto the team. And it is fun to play on the team of God. And there's fellowship with him. Amen? Because guess what? His team doesn't lose. Or they may have some difficulties and struggles and lots of opposition, but they don't lose. And there is such joy in watching somebody experience for the first time that they are loved, valued, and cherished. What's the result? There's unity. Because we're not fighting over the kind of music that ought to be sung and the right kind of worship. We're not worrying about is it too hot or too cold. We're worrying about is where are the people who don't know Christ? 
Why is the seat next to me not filled with a friend, a neighbor, a family member that doesn't know Christ? I'm worried about, are we getting out in the community enough for people to, they're not coming here, we need to be out there. Are we meeting them and loving on them and letting them know Jesus Christ? Move on to verse 25 and 26. What does it mean to know God? He says, that the world, they don't know you, but I know you and they know you. The they being the followers of Jesus Christ. And they know that you sent me. What does that mean to know God? It is that intimate relationship. I know his heart. I may not understand everything about him, but I know his heart. We've been married this next week for three years and I didn't do the math beforehand. Eight months. Right? Married? No? I'm already off? Two years. Two years. So we'll see. And I was worried about the month part. Oh, well, we've been married for not a short time, but a short time, and I'm old. Woo! Good thing that she loves me. It's okay. It's okay. Which I guess is a good example because I know her heart and she knows I make mistakes all the time. (laughs) Last night, she's driving. I'm saying, you need to go, nope, that was wrong. Oh, you need to be, nope, nope. Three directions I gave her and every time it was wrong. She was doing the right thing and I was trying to correct her. She never once complained. She graciously would start to do what I would tell her to do and then pull back into what she knew was right. Every time, very gracious. Uh, So she knows I'm not all together with it. I still don't understand everything about her. I'm still surprised as I'm learning things about her. But what I do know is her heart. This is a very loving woman who loves to give. And she has a passion for the hurting heart. I don't understand everything about God. I was just reading yesterday in my quiet time and I'm still like... And every time I read this passage in Leviticus, I'm like, I don't understand, God. This doesn't make sense. Why would you do this? I just can't fit it into your heart of love. But what I do know is his heart of love. I've had enough experience with him to know his heart, his nature, is that he's faithful, and for whatever reason, he loves me. And he will never forsake me. He will always welcome me back. Failure after failure after failure. He's not counting those. He's just looking for the way I'm focused today. And if I'm focused on him, he's smiling and ready to receive. Because the relationship's what's important, not my track record. The relationship is important to him more than my six sex percentages. What does it mean to know God? It's to know his heart, to know his love, and to know his passion for others to be set free. What's the result of knowing him? I'm going to trust him. Because I know he loves me. He wants what's best for me. And he will never disappoint me. So I'm going to trust him. What's the result of knowing him? I get loved on What's the result of this? I get fellowship with Christ. I get to join him in his ministry. I get to join him in his heart's desire and passion. What is Jesus praying for? That we would get it? That we would be one with his heart and that it would become our top priority in life. We don't have to change your job and all become pastors. God forbid, that wouldn't help anything. You are where you need to be in your job, in your neighborhoods, in your ministry, in your families, because there's people wherever you live, wherever you work, whatever family you're connected with, that needs to know the love of Jesus Christ. You are on your mission field. All he's saying is make it your top priority and all you do at work all you do in your family all you do in your neighborhood is for those around you to know they're loved heavenly father help us again to listen 
to this prayer, to hear your heart's passion, to hear your son's heart's passion, and may it become our heart's passion. That's the unity you're looking for. May we no longer just say, yeah, we want to see people saved, but may we live like we want to see people saved. May we pray, may we give like we want to see people saved. May our hearts beat as yours. Amen. As we get ready for our invitation, is there someone you know that doesn't know Christ yet? Maybe you want to spend this invitation praying that there'll be a day soon that they'll be here to walk down for this invitation, that they will come to know they're loved. Maybe God is laying on your heart a need now, maybe not somebody you need to reconcile with, but somebody you need to just go love on to help them to know the love of Jesus Christ. Whatever he's asking you to do, know we're here as your family to support you. So let's stand and you respond as we sing together, Lord, I'm coming home.